think I stuck with perfect restoration. And I have Jason, who is an independent insurance adjuster, with us just to answer a lot of the questions that we get on a regular basis regarding insurance claims, uh, what what to do, what's changing. So we wanted to bring Jason on, and he was kind enough to, to take some time out of his day to come and answer some of these questions coming from the carrier, uh, not from the contractor. So thank you, Jason, for joining. And why don't you just let everybody know who you are, what you do, and, and what an insurance adjuster does and how that benefits the homeowner. Of course. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, my name is Jason Nicola. I am an independent insurance adjuster. Um, what that is is that um, I have an adjuster's license like a staff adjuster, um, but I'm independent, so I can work for multiple insurance carriers at the same time, as well as multiple independent firms at the same time. And as an insurance adjuster, what we are on the field side is we are the eyes and ears for the insurance company. So when there's a claim filed, um, they take our word for it. Our photos show what they need to see, and we write the estimates um, for the insurance company. Perfect. And I guess maybe you can talk about the difference between uh, a field adjuster and a desk adjuster and kind of what that means because sometimes clients are just confused as to. Of course, uh, yeah. Adjuster. I pretty much have to explain that almost every day to somebody. Um, what a desk adjuster is, um, there's somebody kind of self explanatory. They sit at a desk and they handle many, many claims a day. Um, they have very little experience in the field most of the time. So um, as a field adjuster, we're the ones out, we do the inspection, we write the estimates. Um, we know more about the claims process um, and discuss it with the insured. So the desk adjuster handles more of the paperwork, the payment and the insurance side of it. I always tell people that the field adjusters have the good personalities and the desk adjusters, not so much. I'll probably get in trouble for saying that, but. <laughs> no, I say that every day too. And also I would say I'm, I'm 80% adjuster, 20% adjuster, therapist. Yeah, right. <laughs> so true. Yeah. Uh, so maybe you can address any differences uh, in adjusting now with the coronavirus outbreak, how things are changing, and what that means for the insurance. Yeah. Um, so far, there really hasn't been a whole lot different as far as the job side of it from the insurance carrier. I still get as many claims as I've ever gotten. Um, it's not slowing down. I talked to a supervisor this morning, actually, about it. I was kind of asking about it. And they said, we're essential. So we're not going to slow down. We're just going to keep trucking. Um, what it has changed a lot is how I do business. Um, I wear a mask, I wear gloves. When I call and make the appointment with the insured, I kind of go over everything, how the inspection is going to go. Um, I have them make sure that any door I need to get in is already open. The lights are already on, so I don't have to touch anything as much as possible. Um, if there's no reason for me to, to meet them face to face, like if it's an exterior inspection, we just handle everything over the phone. Um, definitely no handshaking. Well, that's great. That's great. I know a lot of people, a lot of adjusters aren't even going out anymore, and they're just relying on um, video walkthroughs. We just had a loss with uh, Mercury Insurance, and the adjuster sent an app to our phone for our guy to do like a, almost like a Skype call and walk around the house. So it's going to be really relying on good communication between the contractor, the insured, and the adjuster if you're not going out. But that's good that you guys are still going out to assess it. Yep. Yeah, I think that, you know, hopefully on my side of it, I get paid per inspection. So I want to keep doing as many of these as possible. Yeah. And that's what yeah. I'm doing now. If I get a claim sent to me, I inspect it as fast as possible because I don't know when they're going to tell us to stop. Yeah. And I think it's uh, it's good because I think it helps to minimize the, the hiccups and the delays of the back and forth and uh, if you're actually there and you've seen it for yourself, I think that that's going to help move that claim a little bit quicker. But there's oh, great technology out there that, that definitely will help. Um, but I guess seeing in person is believing, right? right? Yep. So what does it mean for the future of claims like this crisis and the way things are changing? Do you think that's going to have any effect in moving forward through the claims process? Do you think they're going to implement this technology? 
technology and maybe small losses it won't send adjusters to you or do you think it's too early to tell um definitely i think it'll change i think there's so much coming out now as far as technology um like you were talking about i was just on a zoom call um with my company about another company coming out as far as as roof and and exterior sketches um, you just have to send in a couple photos from each side of the house and it can sketch the whole roof, the whole exterior of the house for you. Um, interior, it's a little harder. Somebody actually has to go in, whether it's me or a vendor or somebody has to go into the house. Um, I don't know that they're ever going to get to a place where they're going to take an insurance board for it with their photos. Because most of the time, I know when I've asked for photos that maybe I forgot a photo and I just said, hey, can you send me a photo? It's never what I need. <laughs> you know, they don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. So, uh, so they, have, they have a Matterport, which is the 3D technology, and Matterport will actually uh, sketch the whole property. It's an added service, but you can order the sketch through Matterport. So at least it's a third party doing it. Very, very accurate instead of you know, a contractor that maybe doesn't use Xactimate, if that's the program that you're using as a carrier or doesn't know how to sketch and actually put in the windows or their measurements are, are not accurate. So I think that we'll probably see that software make a boom um, and probably continue to, to be very beneficial for the carrier and the contractor. Yeah, I think so too. And I think drones are going to start to be used more and more often for, you know, roof claims. Yeah. The, you know, they are in like the Midwest and other areas that are having the hail storms. We don't get a lot of that here, but I think that that will be, widely used definitely i mean I, I do catastrophe claims so i travel to big storms as well and i've, I've worked hundreds of hailstorms and there's multiple hailstorms i've worked where a drone could easily inspect it because the damage is so bad you can see it you know there's other hailstorms where you really have to search for it that would be really hard for a drone to do but but i know a lot of people using them yeah and that gets rid of a lot of the slip and fall hazards and <laughs> Minor accidents and everything else. Especially, yeah, those roofs in Texas that are all 12-12, two-story. You know, right. it would have been nice to have, especially in August or July in, in Texas. It'd be nice yep. to have your own. Absolutely. So the next question that I got here that uh, we're asked a lot is, what can a client, the insured, uh, not the contractor, but what can the insured do to help the carrier make the claims process go quicker or smoother or faster? Uh, you know, what, what recommendations do you have to them? Yeah. Communication's huge. Um, to be available. Um, so many times I, there's stuff I need where, and, and I'll leave multiple voicemails days after days and then they won't get back to me, you know, cause it's not a top priority for them, but I'm sitting here waiting for it to file my claim. Um, yeah, that's, that's a huge one. But also the stuff, like I said, like just being available to help, turn on the lights, have everything ready, you know, have the dogs put away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've had just, some guys get bit by some little dogs. <laughs> yeah. The little ones are the worst. Yeah, they are. Um, and I think maybe like even, because we went into some bad, bad situations with fires, but having documentation ready to go, like your receipts or yes. pictures. And That's the, huge. You know, especially on the contents level, just be one open minded, but be prepared and responsive. We understand that it's very stressful for everybody, and I think everybody wants to to get this turned around as quick as possible. But there's definitely a lot that leans on the insured to get accurate information for the carrier to be able to uh, process this claim and, and get things paid out quickly. So yeah. is that probably your biggest thing? Is fire? Uh, fire losses with they really need to have good documentation in play yeah i mean that's kind of everything um water losses as well i mean it takes it takes me a lot of time to kind of track down these contractors too just to get an invoice that they should already have um so that's a big thing for the insured to do as well yeah just have everything ready for me where they can say here here's my receipts here's everything and then that that claim can be done that day Instead of me sure. waiting, because if you have to wait for contractors, yeah. I mean, I just finished one where I had to wait an extra two weeks just for receipts. Right. And the insurance yeah. called me wondering what's going on. I said, hey, I'm waiting on your contractor. I call him every day. So I'm curious, and maybe 
it may be a hard question or a question you can't answer, but um, I'm curious. So what we see and what we tell people is you have to do the, the research on the company you're going to hire. We understand like it's an emergency service, but a lot of times we see in our industry, um, a lot of the problem contractors on the emergency services side are the ones that were referred by the plumber. And, and I don't want to go off on a tangent here, but a lot of times those contractors, they just don't have the documentation and the systems in place to where they're very proficient and they've got great reviews. It's more of like, Hey, I'm giving the plumber thousands of dollars for a referral. Yeah. So they didn't have to rely on great customer service and great communication and great documentation. Is that, if you can answer, is that more where your hiccups come into play? Yeah, I see it all the time where, you know, not even somebody that they referred, but somebody will come in and, and the, you know, they'll work for a day, tear some stuff out, and then they can't get a hold of them for another week. Right. You know, or or I can't stand it when a, a company doesn't use, like, Xactimate, you know, and they just give me a lump sum estimate, and then I have to try and figure it out, you know, where are we off, you know, square footage wise or anything like that. It's really difficult. So it makes a big difference. Sure. And a lot of times that's where you see your claims that should not even be an insurance claim turned into an insurance claim. And the scope of work is so exaggerated with what needs to be done because they see dollar signs. It's not about the relationship. It's about that transaction. It's about, I got to recoup the money that I just spent for this referral. Um, so it's kind of crazy. Yep, I see it almost daily. Perfect. Um, uh, next biggest question is: Does a con? Does the insured have to use the preferred vendor? A lot of times, we've had actually some carriers tell an insured that their claim will only be covered if they use the preferred vendor, which is just crazy to me. And there's right. some carriers out there uh, that will do that, but people are a lot of times they're just confused. Like, do I have to use the preferred or can I use my own contractor? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And they 100% do not have to use preferred contractor. And, and I've worked with some companies that have said that before too. And I don't, give me if I'm wrong, but I don't think it's up to them. I think it's a California department of insurance. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's basically <laughs> Right, they can't refer te technically through uh, insurance laws. They can't even refer a contractor unless they're letting them know in writing that they can uh, use whoever they want. Right. Or they're not even supposed to refer a contractor unless the client is specifically asking for help. But I mean, it, so it happens, but can you think of a reason of why the carriers push hard to use the preferred vendor? Yeah, um, I think that they trust them more because they keep an eye on them. Um, it's hard to become a preferred contractor, I think, um, and it's probably even harder to stay one. Um, if you mess up, you're you're in pretty big trouble. So they keep a pretty good eye on them. Um, so I think most of the time, you know, when when a care or when a vendor comes out and they're preferred, um, if they're there for the insurance company, they try and do a pretty good job. They don't want to yeah. mess up. Yeah, I think the company, the carrier has a little bit more control because of exactly. that relationship. And I think it's easier uh, to become a preferred vendor if, like, you're the franchise uh, exactly. organization compared I to. Say any names, but yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, there's, a, there's a ton of them out there. Yeah. Compared to, like, your local mom and pop shop. So, yeah. uh, you know, I can see that. And I think that, um, realistically speaking, there's a lot of carriers that are so defensive because of for lack of better terms, the crap that they see from some of these contractors, restoration contractors, um, that they're, they're just leaning that way of like, Hey, I want to close this thing out. And if I don't know who you're calling, you know, I'd, I'd rather work with my guy that I know I can get things resolved and get this off my desk because I have four claims a day. That's exactly. probably some of what's they going do, on. They right see a, lot of, a lot of horror stories and most of them are not from preferred vendors. Right. You know? Yeah. I mean, to be clear, we're not a preferred vendor. Um, we were for a little bit, but I, I have nothing against the preferred vendor um, deal. That's you make a decision of which way you're going to go. Uh, it's something that we're always exploring. If we want to do that again, uh, we, we prefer, I almost call it a little bit of a conflict of interest because you are stuck in the middle where I'd rather represent the insurer, do a good job, but still have great communication 
and a great relationship with the adjuster because I view the adjuster as my client as well because that's how I'm getting paid if it's an insurance claim. So I want to make sure we're all in agreement and we're on the same page and we're moving forward. Right. And you want it to be as easy as possible. Right. Because I want to get paid sometime like this year. Yeah. Not, not next year. <laughs> right. So you don't want to ruin that relationship with an adjuster that you're going to work with over and over and then just have it be a nightmare every time you guys work together just because that relationship was, was tarnished somehow. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think that there's a, um, there's a misbelief that all restoration companies always want to turn everything into an insurance claim. And I think that you're, professional restoration companies if there's a way not to they're gonna not do that because if i can have something be small enough where it can be handled cash not go through insurance i'm getting paid faster for one the homeowner is not going to risk getting dinged or paying more on their on their policy or getting canceled so it's a really a a win-win i mean average time for us to get paid is typically 30 to 60 days just because it has to go through so many approvals and uh, documentation checks and maybe third party reviews. Then if they throw the mortgage company on top of that check, well, there's another 30 days. So yeah, not all restoration companies want to make it bigger than it is. Uh, If you feel that way, then maybe you just need a second opinion of who you had come out to your house and looking at doing the work. Yeah. And you're right. Most of these preferred vendors are franchises and I think they get in, you know, mostly solely by name. You know, and it can be totally different from town to town who you work with, who you deal sure. with. Unfortunately, you get a lot of these companies that they think the opposite. Like, well, insurance is involved and they're going to pay for this. So they start tearing stuff out that they shouldn't. Right. Try and buy their new boat. Yeah. <laughs> no names, no names. No. Um, does a client have to wait for the insurance carrier to give them approval to start we'll say mitigating the loss. So uh, meaning the extraction for people that don't know what the mitigation side, like your extraction of water, maybe setting up drying or and preventing further damage, not talking about repairing, but right. No. Yeah, absolutely not. They do not have to wait, nor should they. um, Because all you're doing is going to cause more damage. So um, my advice to the homeowners is document everything, photos, um, like we talked about before, every invoice, keep everything. But photos are super, super important. Um, I've had quite a few claims that, that got denied just because there was no proof. And I recommend, as a homeowner, take good photos and make sure that all your photos aren't just close-ups because that can be hard later to determine what room was that in, what wall. Exactly. But also just take a video walkthrough. And a video you can document all the damages, but you can also tell the story. So now you have some audio behind that and that's easier for an adjuster who's coming in after the fact, or maybe a desk adjuster who will never even come to your house to see your loss, understand the full picture of what happened. Yeah. Luckily nowadays people are pretty good with videos. Everybody has a small, a smartphone. So they're always taking videos. But yeah. That was always the main thing. Every picture I got from an insured was a close up. Yeah. Every single one. Even when yeah. I tell them what I need and, and even, you know, daily now when I'm taking overview photos, they're like, why are you taking a photo, you know, of the whole room? Like, are you trying to show my mess? I'm like, no, I just need a photo of the room. So they know what room this is, what it looks like. And, and more importantly, I go back to my photos almost every single claim and I'll look them over and say, is there something I'm missing? Is there something I need to detach and reset that I didn't write down? You know, so I study my photos. Yeah, I think as a as a homeowner or for a homeowner, if you want if you're gonna go and you're gonna document any damages, like get a picture of like right at the doorway of the room and then just go from the left all the way to the right, get your aerial photos or, or your overall photos, and then you can kind of go and do your close ups. Yeah. But try to do it room by room so the adjuster understands like what room he's in when he gets that close up. That will help move things uh, along faster and I mean, it, it, we have the same struggle even with with employees. Sometimes they're, they're right in the middle of it. And it's like, oh, okay, I got to take this picture of this damage I didn't see. And it's like, well, what room was that in? Yeah. So that's I why do, there's like technology. And even adjusters, some of these adjusters don't know how to do that. Sure. Absolutely. 
Uh, or a big question for you. Do adjusters yeah. have to have any construction background or experience if they're out there uh, being a field adjuster and they're evaluating what needs to be done to repair your house? Yeah, unfortunately, no, they don't. All they have to do is take a test and you're an adjuster. Um, it would help if everybody had to. I have friends that have been an adjuster twice as long as I have that call me all the time and send me photos. Say, what is this? How do I fix this? Just because I was a contractor for about 15 years. So it made it a really easy transition for me. Um, I can walk into a room and within minutes know exactly what I need to put this room back to how it used to be, where I know what's behind that wall, you know? So unfortunately, a lot of adjusters don't have that information. <laughs> Very, very unfortunate. Especially the desk adjusters. <laughs> yeah. The the best adjusters that we ever work with have construction experience. They don't come in and, and classify everything as a cost of doing business because they were in business and they know what yeah. is a job cost compared to what is a cost of doing business. They understand the way a property has to be put back together instead of just saying, well, on the last one, we use this code, this code, this code but it has to make sense. Uh, yep. So it's for sure our fastest closed out claims are claims where the adjuster was a contractor. They get it. It could be a quick conversation uh, and, and we're on the same page. So absolutely. I wish that they would make that a standard um, because I, it would help everybody. I think it would help one cut out unnecessary costs because yeah. some people are just going to have things pulled over their eyes when they don't know, um, yeah. but it's going to move things uh, it's going to move things forward so much faster too. Yeah. I was going to say that exact thing. Not only can I see what needs to be done, I know what doesn't need to be done. Right. I know when a contractor is trying to put stuff in an estimate that doesn't need to be there. Um, but also when you have that experience as a contractor, you start talking to a contractor and they can tell, you know what you're talking about, then they change their attitude real quick. Sure. And, and it makes it a lot easier. Like you said, so what do you recommend to a homeowner? Cause we see this on a regular basis. Um, even, even with our own clients, just to be fully transparent is you have a, a homeowner and insured that they're stuck between, Hey, my contractor saying this has to be done. And my adjusters on here saying the opposite. So maybe the contractor saying, uh, that obviously more work's needed. The adjuster is not agreeing with that. What would be your advice to them to try to come to some resolution on bridging that gap. Yeah, well, it really shouldn't be up to them. It, that's the adjuster's job. Um, so what the insured should do, they'll send in their estimate from the contractor into into the carrier and say, hey, you know, we're off, you know, $10,000 or whatever it is. So the insurance company, they send it back to me and say, hey, get with the contractor, see where you're off, see what's going on. And usually it's just something either I missed or they missed. And it's something super easy and it should be able to be taken care of. Um, a lot of times it's, it's something that's not warranted and the contractor's trying to put in there, but, but insurance isn't out to not pay for stuff. If it's warranted and, and you can explain it, then put it in there and, and we'll get it paid for. Sure. Yeah. I think we're all human. So contractors are going to make mistakes. Adjusters are going to make mistakes. Um, so we've had some where adjusters just like, Hey, I got confused because I had four losses that day and I forgot which one I got back to my office needed to say it happens. So that's yeah. where really it's going to be communication. And I think that, I think as a homeowner, you have to take ownership of your claim too. some homeowners just they're like, Hey, I hired a contractor. Now I'm done. And mm -hmm. as a, as a contractor, as a restoration contractor, we want to eliminate as much of that stress from them as possible. But right. I think a homeowner should be involved throughout that process because it is their home. So, oh, 100%. Yeah, a lot of homeowners get scared because they don't know anything about the process. Um, but I always, I, I emphasize to them, say, hey, make your contractor do this work too. Yeah, yeah, I'm writing an estimate. I'm drawing the sketch. I'm measuring everything. But they should too. Um, you know, if, I, if my estimate comes up to 10 grand, their estimate may come up to 8,500. You know, we don't care. The insurance company doesn't care. We say that's worth 10 grand. So you're going to get that. Right. If your contractor just says, well, I'll just, I'll do what the insurance says they're going to do it for. 
then they're making that extra 1500 bucks where normally they wouldn't. So sure. it's worth it to the insured to pay attention and to, to do their own work. Yeah, I never understood that um, really of a, a contractor that just says, I'm going to work off the insurance scope. Because as a contractor, I want to warranty my job. So I want to put in what we are going to do. Yeah. You know, because it's not about, for us, it's not about the price. Like, it, we don't look at it and be like, this job's worth 20 grand. It's really about the scope. And, and yeah. the prices are built into that scope. And when I write every single thing down, like we're going to do this, 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 and this, and there's a contract to that, we're going to be held liable to that. And that's why I don't want to go off an insurance scope and be like, hey, they put that in there, but we don't really need to do that. Well, then why am I getting paid for it? It doesn't make any sense. Right. So especially for a homeowner, having that contractor actually prepare that, that estimate and that breakdown of what they're going to do is important to be able to hold them responsible for anything later if it's a, a warranty covered item instead of oh no well that was just in the insurance scope that wasn't part of our scope of work so yeah, there's yeah. plenty of issues to, to come up from that too that's one thing i learned early on in my adjusting career is not to worry about price once you right. start looking at that then you're gonna skimp on stuff or because or, i was always worried when i first started i'm like i don't want my claims to be too big because i thought they really cared about that right but they really don't. If you can explain it, you know, these companies have money. So your $30,000 claim, I'm going to break them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'll ask one, one more question uh, that constantly gets brought up is there's a lot of, and I'd rather it come from you, but there's a lot of insureds that they'll have communication of like, oh no, I, I need to keep this as low as possible for the insurance company. I know that this is damaged, but I don't want the insurance to pay for it because if I keep it low enough, maybe they won't raise my rates or maybe right. they won't drop me. And I think like if you have a claim, our, our advice is just get what you're entitled to, to yeah. restore your home to pre-loss because we don't look at it as, well, if you save them money, they're going to save you money. But I'd rather, you know, what's your take on that for advice to a homeowner? Yeah. And I give them this advice all the time because I have insureds um, tell me that exact same thing that they're worried about it. I said, look, insurance, the purpose for insurance is to make this exactly how it was before that happened. You know, it's not supposed to be any better or any worse, but usually it's better because it's all brand new. Right. And, and it doesn't matter what it costs. Um, depending on, you know, obviously the person, if they have, you know, 20 different claims of them starting fires in their kitchen while they're cooking, you know, it's going to affect their premium. Most of these that, you know, they don't affect their premium if it's a pipe burst or a, a, especially a weather claim. You know, they didn't cause any of that stuff. So it's not supposed to count against them. And okay. I, I try and tell them, say, hey, most, most people have been paying insurance for 40 years. You know, most of the people I meet have never filed a claim. Right. I take advantage of it. You pay it for a reason. You wouldn't do that at the doctor, you know, after right. you've been paying health insurance. Say, well, I don't want the best care you know, cause it might be more expensive. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Take advantage That's of that. So, <laughs> so what, uh, I guess we'll go into, um, if you can explain to the insurance out there, maybe the difference between a public adjuster yeah. and, and like an IA, um, or somebody that works on the carrier side. Yeah. So a public adjuster, um, they don't work for anybody but themselves. They work for technically for the homeowner, but they're there for the dollar figure. They want that claim to be as big as possible because they get a percentage of it. Right. Technically, so do I. I get a percentage of each claim, so I want it to be as big as possible. But um, what I have guidelines I have to follow. It has to be warranted. Um, so a public adjuster, those are the ones I have the biggest fights with, arguments. That stuff that goes back and forth and back and forth. Um, but it's kind of the same as a contractor. I mean, if they can explain it and tell me why, why they need this or that, then the insurance will pay it. But insurance companies, they don't really like working with public adjusters. Yeah. You know, a lot of contractors don't uh, as well. But I think that there is definitely a time and a place for a public adjuster if you have a difficult carrier and they're just yeah. not covering something. That's great. But, I mean, like what I can't stand to see is – you know, we get re we we don't chase any fires at all. We get referred, and we just recently had two fires. One was one of my employees' neighbors, 
uh, and the other one was one of my employee's wife's coworker. So we got called out to both of those to help these people when it's fresh, when the fire department's still there in the line of public adjusters standing on the sidewalk, yeah. just just trying to secure that job with all the false promises. And I mean, I was inside one of them with the homeowner as, uh, as public adjusters are coming one by one to talk to the wife and, you know, try to secure all these lies of what's going to happen to them if they don't hire a public adjuster yep. It's just absolutely crazy. And, and their fees go, you know, some are 5%, some are 10%, some are 20%. I see 40% yep. of, as a fee. And I'm like, what are you left with? to restore your property. If everything's on the up and up, you have no money left. Right. And it's really no difference than just having a reputable contractor that can talk about what needs to be done, why it needs to be done and have the conversation and you're not losing anything. Everything's going right to your home. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree. There are, there are very few instances where I think public gesture is great. Um, but most of the time, if you have a good adjuster and a good contractor, there's definitely no need for a public adjuster. Yeah. I think the idea of becoming a public adjuster for a while, but, but I just, I've had so many bad experiences and a lot of them are with, especially in Southern California with the smoke claims from all the wildfires. Those are the ones I really deal with them. They go door to door, they send flyers to every house. Hey, I can get you money. Um, quick story. I was up in, was it Lake Elsinore, North of Lake Elsinore. And I had a homeowner. I was doing the inspection with the public adjuster and I'm chatting with the homeowner and it was noted that they had previous claims. So I always ask about those. She's like, yeah, I had two previous smoke losses within the last six years. And each time the insurance company pays them, uh, it was ridiculous, like almost 30 grand, you know, just for the smoke and ash claim, just to clean their house. And so I asked her, I said, so what company do you get to clean your house? And she's like, oh, I just clean it myself. I clean it really good. I said, we paid you. This will be the third time now, you know, 20 plus grand each time for you to clean your own house. And, Jeez. and those are the kind of things where unfortunately sometimes those public adjusters, they just throw us up to the wall to see what sticks with the insurance company. And a lot of yeah. times it's through the cracks. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that like the smoke and ash claims, um, you know, some of them for sure will be high ticket items. If you're close and you have, you know, damage in your attic and you're re removing insulation and, uh, you have contents, but there should be some inspection that gets done. But yeah, we've seen just recently where we have, you know, people calling us four blocks away from the fire, just saying, oh, well, my neighbors are getting paid and we're in there and, and we can't find any transfer of any soot, char, or ash. We're like, there's nothing here for you, but they'll get the flyer, you know, they're, they're going to get the money. So we've worked actually uh, over the years, we've not worked with, but been involved with some PAs that are, are very like up and up. They actually came from the carrier side. Yep. Um, rates are very reasonable and there's some carriers and I'm not going to name any names, but there's some carriers that if <laughs> the insured needs a PA almost every single time. Um, so there's, there's definitely a time and a place for it, but not in every situation. And I would say, let the claim play out. And if you get to a stalling or stopping point where you just can't, have any reasonable resolution, then maybe you have to look at hiring a public adjuster, a public adjuster or an attorney, but not from day one before you yeah, even know. Money. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times with the carrier, it depends on the adjuster. We have some carriers that some adjusters are so good. They're so good. They understand the process. There's construction background. Claims are approved very quick, but same carrier, different adjuster. It's dragging on. You're fighting over everything. So Again, to, to anybody out there, just let the claim process, like let it play itself out and then determine where you have to go from there. If you're a business owner, if you have other properties in different areas, I can understand maybe wanting a public adjusting firm to represent you when you really want zero involvement, um, you know, but that's, that's going to be a case by case basis. Right. But for the average homeowner of your home, let the claim process play itself out. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely a lot of public adjusters I've met that were really good. Yeah. Um, but again, the, the insurers just throwing money away. I didn't need them there. Like the, I've met so many public adjusters that are just there. I still do all the work and do all, the whole estimate and they do nothing except, you know, they're just there on behalf of the insured. So they get paid. Right. And they get their check. Yep. And a lot of times when you do have the PA, um, just to 
to be frank, that claim could be delayed significantly mm -hmm. when you're fighting over trying to make it about every single penny or dollar that you can get. Um, you, you may be out of your house for a very long time. Uh, so I, I don't want to be a, a bash on PAs because there's great public adjusters, there's bad public adjusters, there's great contractors, there's bad contractors, there's great adjusters and bad. It, it, it's across the board. But just as a homeowner, I think it's good for you to know that um, it's not something that you have to go. And if you're a fire damage victim or if you're going to have a fire, you're going to have these public adjusters lined up on your doorstep. And we just want you to know that that's not something you have to do. Don't feed into the lies. They have you know, big money that they're spending on scanners to get the, your, your address. Sometimes they're beating the fire department out there. But yeah. um, let take a minute to just to settle in, to get your bearings, to get the information. Don't make a decision right away. Do some research on who you're hiring uh, and then go from there. Yeah. And even like you said, that was, that was good what you said. Even some adjusters are bad. So one thing insured should know that they don't, most of them don't know, they can request a different adjuster. If I come out, they don't like my personality. They didn't think I was engaged or I didn't look at something or they don't like my estimate. They can call for reinspection and right. the insurance company will send out a different adjuster at no cost to the insured. Yeah, that's great. And sometimes they're not so willing to do that, but I think you have to yeah. stand your ground, right? Stay firm. Yeah. Squeaky wheel. Definitely. Perfect. Well, any, anything else that you want to touch on before we end the call? Any, any, questions that we didn't cover that you get asked on a regular basis or advice for homeowners? No, just now it's just weird. You know, everything's a little different right now. So, you know, the insured can do the little things, like I said, to help us out just to be safer. Um, I still go into the people's house where they still want to shake my hand and they're like, Oh, this is a hoax. Yeah. Just respect people. Yeah. Uh, you know, if I show up and I have gloves on and a mask, you know, that, then stay away. You know, just let me do my job yeah. and get on there and, and, and it'll go smoothly. Yeah. But, you know, for one, just, I don't know. So, so many people have different experiences, but I say, trust your insurance company. They're there to help you if you use them. And, and if you stay on top of it, like you said, pay attention um, and work with your contractor and you'll, most people have a good experience with it. Yeah, it may, it may feel weird keeping your distance and not shaking hands because we're so accustomed to that. But understand that it's weird on both sides. Like, it's just normal <laughs> practice for us to go in and be like, hey, how's it going? Nice to meet yep. you. Shake your hand. My first it's couple of things has to happen. When, yeah. I, when I didn't shake hands. But, but I like it. I'm kind of a germaphobe anyway. So if we went away from handshakes forever, I would love that. Yeah. No well, just wear gloves all the time. Yeah. Then you look like a crazy person. But. <laughs> We start bowing. I like that idea. Yeah, right. There you go. Yeah. Well, well, I appreciate your time, man, and, and all your insight. Um, it's really helped out, and I think it's going to help out because we've always been the contractor giving the information. So I think hearing it from the carrier side will just help people make good decisions and educated decisions and have some faith, um, you know, on the carrier and contractor perspective yeah. and let them have – in encourage them to speak encourage your adjuster to pick up the phone and talk to your contractor encourage a three-way conversation where you're part of that communication like anything in writing just say make sure i'm cc'd on everything if it's a if they're not having any resolution jump on a phone call and make that communication happen and i think that that's going to help everything be smoother and get done quicker definitely yeah and i think it's good for people to see that contractors and adjusters actually get along most of the time and absolutely and get it figured out perfect well hey man i appreciate it and thanks again for uh for your time and if you guys have any questions i'll, I'll gonna record this which i didn't do i did i did record it good um <laughs> I'll, I'll probably put it on social media and then if anybody has any questions uh maybe we'll do a follow-up on another call later awesome thanks for having me. I appreciate yeah, thank it. you i appreciate it stay safe you too